When in the seminary, the astute professors were want to uh, were want to ask a question in order to see how well we really were thinking, and so they would ask the question, "What was the Trinity doing in in, in the time before time was created? What was the Trinity doing?" If you were smart, and most of us weren't, the answer was nothing, because before time was created, there was nothing save the Trinity. And by that answer, they did not in any way mean to profess that there wasn't something present before time, but simply to emphasize time itself is a created entity, and it is created by the Creator. And so, in this, in this solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, we must understand the nature of the mystery, and most especially that we are here confronted with a supernatural mystery, which is a truth which we cannot fully understand, but which we firmly believe because we have God's word for it. It is above our reason to understand, but not contrary to it. No man can explain the mystery, neither can anyone know it, unless it is revealed by God. And so, in this mystery, we are dealing with a mystery truly revealed by God, but it is the mystery that is the core and at the heart of the whole of creation. Without embracing it, man falls to error, and he begins that downward descent like the Samaritan from Jerusalem to Jericho, that is, from the highest place in the Holy Land, Jerusalem, symbolic of heaven, to the lowest place in the Holy Land, Jericho, symbolic of hell, all ultimately rests on whether we embrace this doctrine of the Most Holy Trinity. The doctrine simply stated says, there is one God, and in the one God there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We say there are three persons in one God because each, because to each belongs something we cannot attribute to the other. See, we think there is no reason involved, but there is. Why do we say that in the one God, truly one God, there are three persons? Because one has something that cannot be attributed to the other, that is, his distinct origin. Each has an origin that is rooted in the mystery of eternity and so human language will always fail to grasp the very depths of this mystery. Try, we must, to ponder into it, but we must also always approach it with that supernatural, with that supernatural understanding and ultimately with that understanding of St. Bonaventure. There are some mysteries of Almighty God that are best approached with finger reverently placed over one's mouth. Try as we may to understand this mystery, it is not possible, for only God himself understands it in, in, in that unique way that he alone can understand it. But we must, if we are to understand our very call, it, that is, the call we received from our very creation. And so we try in using human language to delve into this mystery the best we can, even the term Father, Son, and Holy Spirit cannot quite, quite catch the essence of this mystery, but human language must strive to understand it according to the limitations it has. And so we say that from all eternity, the Father begets the Son. We say beget to emphasize love is present. The, the, the Father begets the Son, and the Son proceeds from the Father. From all eternity, the Father and the Son breathe forth the Holy Spirit, and he, and he proceeds from them as from one source. The three divine persons are truly distinct one from another. We say there is one Father, not three fathers. We say there is one Son, not three sons. We say there is one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. Neither person is before or after the other. None is greater or lesser than the other, but all are co-eternal and all are co-equal with each other, so that in all things the unity and the Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped, as St. Athanasius would declare in the Athanasius Creed, and ultimately that is the source of our very life, the worship 
of the most blessed Trinity. And so, how is the distinct origin of each person to be explained in so far as human language can explain it? To that, we owe great gratitude to the church and ultimately to the apostles who have handed on this truth from the one whom they received it. And it is precisely from the one whom they received it why we go forward in confidence knowing that while we cannot penetrate the depths of this mystery, we can understand it to a certain level in this life and ultimately we will be mystified by it for all eternity if we gain that eternal life with the blessed Trinity in the life to come. And it is precisely this reason why we can never be exhausted nor bored in heaven because we ponder a mystery that is truly a mystery and truly beyond our capacity and our understanding in this life. Indeed, even when we reflect upon the purity of heaven, the, 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 the things of this life, the images it con conjures, d diminish that which it truly is. For if you were raised in the ivory soap generation as I was, then we talk about the purity of heaven as something white. But then when we reflect upon that, we immediately become bored. For if heaven is simply whitewashed walls, no one would wish to be there. But we know that that is not what heaven is like. Heaven is where the blessed Trinity is, and it is where we hope to go. And so we try to explain it by saying that God is a spirit, and the first act of a spirit is to know and to understand God's knowledge of himself from all eternity brings forth the knowledge of himself, that is, his own image. This, however, is no mere thought, as our knowledge of ourselves would be, but it is a living person of the same substance and one with the Father. As St. John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it is precisely this mystery by which we are to understand the eternal begetting of the Son from the Father. And then the Father, seeing his own image in the Son, loves the Son, and the, loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father from all eternity. Each loves the other because each does, each sees in the other the infinity of the Godhead, the beauty, the beauty of divinity, and the supreme truth of God. The two persons loving each other do not merely possess, that is, have a thought of each other as we would, but their mutual love is breathed forth in a living person, one of them and of their own substance. This is God, the Holy Spirit. This spirit of love proceeds from the Father and the Son. It is known as the doctrine of the circumcession, and ultimately, if there were not three persons in one God, then we would have a serious problem. For St. John also confirms this doctrine when he quotes our Lord, saying, But when the Advocate has come, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, will bear witness concerning me. And so, why is it that God is one and God is three? For ultimately, if the love of the Father and the Son is not completed in the love of the Holy Spirit, then there is no truth to what St. John, John the Evangelist says. God is love. And it is precisely because of this communion of persons that God is truly love. And indeed, it is this mystery that is behind the mystery revealed to us in Genesis. For when God sought to create man, he first built the house. And then he declared, let us create man in our own image and in our likeness, in the image of God he created him. Notice that the Holy Spirit inspired the author Moses to first speak in the plural. Let us create him in our own image and likeness, in the image of God he created him. And we have right there the very seeds of, the very seeds of this teaching of the Blessed Trinity. And so it is the life of all Christians that should be a life of a reflection on this most holy trinity. It has very practical ramifications. Practical from the word ultimately that means practice. Ramifications from that which comes out of the tree, that is, the limbs. It is on this truth of the trinity that all our life must be lived and we must bear the fruit of the trinity. For when we reflect upon this mystery, then we begin to reflect of those profound words that we, 
God's creatures are created in his own image and in his own likeness, and yet we are, for the church teaches very clearly that in each and every one of us there is, there is, there is body and soul, and in the soul primarily is reflected the image of God, for there is one soul in each and every one of us with three faculties, our memory, our understanding, and our will, but that is not to diminish that we are a union of body and soul. For in the body, we are also a reflection of the incarnation of the Son, and ultimately, it is that life of the Blessed Trinity that we are to live, that life that would be revealed to us by the Son himself. And so, we must always seek to cooperate with the will of God, bringing about that which reflection on the Trinity truly teaches us, ultimately, We are here to cooperate with God in creating beauty, and ultimately, that is the doctrine of stewardship. It is not a doctrine that focuses on saving the environment because we believe in Mother Earth. It is a doctrine that that focuses on restoring creation ruined by the fall, but restoring it with a supernatural truth in our mind. And indeed, it has great ramifications in our day and in our age. For ultimately, we must begin again to see beauty reflected in each and every one of our neighbors. We live in a society in which that is almost universally denied. We think, because we call something, for instance, the social media, that it is truly social. But there is really no social aspect of it. I open a Facebook page. Someone says something I don't like. I just deface him. Throw him out. Deface him. There is no greater insult that we can perpetrate upon a man, but we can do it so readily and so easily in what we're called the social media because that person whom we are called to love as ourselves isn't standing there before us. And each and every day of our lives, more news comes of someone who posted something on a Facebook that caused the other person to despair and take their lives. There is no social aspect to such nonsense. They can be used for good. But we must understand, all things must be used in moderation. How often do these things simply become a vehicle of idleness, gossip, and all other manner of sin? And we think because we don't do it directly to the person, no sin is committed. When you deface another human being, you commit a sin. Because we weren't here to be defaced. It is Satan who tries to steal our identity. And every sin each and every one of us commits is not an imitation of the love of the Trinity, but the anti-love of Satan. How much idleness is spent in our modern world? We go and constantly entertain ourselves. When the price of one ticket at the latest theater could feed 10 to 20 children in a country far away from us. But I don't have any responsibility to those who live in other countries. It is the unique mystery of the reorganization of the human family under the church through the Holy Spirit by which we can truly declare we are all one family in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go forth and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. None of us is not a brother or a sister to anyone in this We are brothers and sisters to all, each and every one. There are billions of people neither you or myself will ever see in my life, but they are my brother and they are my sister. And I have an obligation to be generous to them as the Holy Trinity was generous to me. That is, not abandoning me when I abandon him. And so it is not our generosity that is reflected in our works of charity. 
It is the very generosity of the Blessed Trinity. No act of charity, insofar as it is true charity, can be carried out in this world without the grace of the Holy Spirit. We may not attribute it to him, but it is his work insofar as it is true charity. And it is the ubris of the modern world to try to acquire, to acclaim, to rapine those things that are of God. That is, to deem equality with God something I can grasp at. Scripture says our Lord saw equality with God, not something to be grasped at. Why? Because he was the second person of the Blessed Trinity, and he had equality with God from all eternity. Satan is the one who repined. In each and every time we perform an act of charity and try to accrue the glory to ourselves, we repine to the glory of God. We try to steal that which is his. As members of his body, we are incorporated into a mystery by which the works of Christ and the Blessed Trinity are to be carried out into each and every one of us. And so we must have a constant program by which we try to sanctify those faculties of the soul, sanctifying the memory with the knowledge of God, storing in our understanding the divine truths, and pressing in our hearts the love of God so we always are willing to serve him. Memory, understanding, and will. And how is it that we are enabled to grasp these concepts with the faculties of our souls and carry them out? Because as St. Paul tells us, God has no eyes on earth now but mine. Or as St. Francis also says, no hands but mine, no arms but mine, no feet but mine, because the body is a reflection of the incarnation. It is given to us to carry out the works of Christ. How many truly believe they carry out the work of Christ when hand in hand, arm in arm, they walk into the modern theater shows and then have their minds and hearts saturated with the violence and the filth that is perpetrated on the human family through what we call Hollywood. To which one of the greatest theologians and teachers that this country has ever received, commissioned by Pope Paul VI to be the catechetical watchdog through cardinal heating of this nation, Monsignor Eugene Cavan declared emphatically, Every single picture that comes out of Hollywood, if it is attributed directly to Hollywood, has deliberately contained within it a blasphemy. Deliberately. And we see that even sometimes in what are ostensibly good movies. Somewhere within it is thrown in that which blasphemes God. How many times are we going to read reviews and it makes one cringe to think that these reviews are published by what are called Catholic public publications in which we can go to this movie because of justifiable violence, justifiable blasphemy, justifiable nudity. When are those things ever justified? When? When are they justified? Who has the right to blaspheme the most august God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Who has the right to expose their flesh in a way that tempts their neighbor? No one. Who has the right to perpetrate unwanted violence just for violence sake on their neighbor? And we think these things have no ramifications. And I must claim for myself ignorance of this matter. And if I had been obedient to my father like we should, I would have seen it. He once told me that he was very fearful of what was going on. And he used a place down the street. He asked me one time, 
Son, what do you see down the end of the street? I told him, woods. What was it when you were growing up? He said, that was the ball lots, Dad. So why was it the ball lots? Because you guys played everything down there. Football, baseball, basketball, everyone. You tended it. No one's tending it now. It's literally overgrown. And you know why? Because kids are inside, in front of computers, in all kinds of images, learning to do what you learned down there. You learn to associate hitting someone with pain. They disassociate the hitting because when they see it, they don't feel the pain. And so you learned to work things out. These children won't, son, and there'll be a grave price to play. I said, Dad, that's a little extreme until two months later. In reading a newspaper article, I had to say, Dad, would you come here for a minute? I need to apologize. He said, why? I said, you remember two months ago when you told me what was going to happen? You were right. The article read, a young boy of 12 killed a girl of nine. And when the EMTs got there, the only thing the boy was saying, why won't she get up? Why won't she get up? They always get up on TV. Why won't she get up? She imitated the wrestling entertainers and jumped off his mother's dinner table right into the poor girl's skull, thinking nothing would happen because they always get up. Children are children because they're in formation and their minds and their hearts must be formed according to divine truths. These children don't know the fifth commandment. Or if they are told the fifth commandment, they are allowed to do things that raise them to live contrary to it their whole lives. You cannot teach the child, thou shalt not kill, and then allow them to sit down in front of consumers. The average American child, the average American child, I believe, by the age of 12, has seen through some media form over 60,000 acts of murder on average. On average. Is this the life of the Trinity? Did God come to murder us? That is not what the doctrine teaches. God came to love us and to forgive us. And it is that loveness and forgiveness that we must give to others. And if the body doesn't cooperate with the life of the Trinity, then the world has no hope. No hope. If they don't see the love of the Trinity in the mystical body of Christ, the works of the Holy Spirit are thwarted. Not because God gives up his omnipotence, but because God has ordained that his power and majesty and love be brought through the weak vessels that we are, but by a profound mystery we were not worthy of, we were incorporated into the carrying out of his works until the end of time. We his body. That is a great dignity that can only be exercised with great humility. And humility begins by recognizing we are his creatures. He is our creator. The brave new world seeks to go forth without knowledge and love of the Holy Trinity. And that's why the brave new world is a cruel world. And don't delude yourselves into thinking that the author was condemning it. He wanted it. He wanted it. Simply because of a hatred of God. If you don't believe that the majority of what our minds are being formed with are formed by people who are anti-God, then go to the sources. Someone can sit here and tell you all they want, for instance, that the uh, Star Trek, you know, to boldly go where no man has gone before, just innocent scientific fun, not in the minds of Gene Roddenberry, its creator, 
who in the Humanist magazine was quoted, and I quote, the whole purpose of it was to do away with the notion of a blood sacrifice, that is the sacrifice of Christ. He spent two weeks of his childhood in a Catholic convent of good sisters who loved him, but somehow acquired a hatred, not only for God, but for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And if the, the composer, the director, the writer, the producer, the creator of something says, this is its purpose, then we are not to argue with his purpose. We are simply to refuse cooperation with it. If he said his purpose was to do away with the Christian notion of a blood sacrifice, believe him. Believe him. He means it. And every single one of them mean it. We think because it's technologically sound, that is, spectacular or marvelous with the latest fad, that it's okay. We have no reflection about what it's really saying. When we allow our children to sit down and listen to hours and hours and watch hours and hours of the Transformers, do we understand what the cosmology involved is? Go to the director. Or the matrix. Go to the directors. In speaking with a young man and watching it, it was very easy to conclude, if you have any catechetical knowledge at all. First conclusion, the directors were Catholic. Second conclusion, one of them is probably no longer what God created him to be, that is, a man. Now, you can figure it out because he no longer is. And it was easy to see. As long as you have the power to manipulate matter, you can manipulate it any way you want. That is tyranny. That is not love. That is tyranny. Two pills to take. Ah, tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when this so-called new Messiah is freed, why is he freed? Because he chooses not to go the route of baptism. It's so clear if you just know your catechism. And then if that's not good enough, go to the ones who do it. They say it themselves. They teach it. It's an interesting thing how many of them are invited in to give seminars at universities. We must understand this reality in our modern world, this phenomenon that is contrary to our faith, contrary to the love that today's solemnity puts before us, contrary to the mystery of the Trinity. Before time, God was perfectly content in himself. He needed nothing. He could not be augmented he could not be made glorious. He could not be made more magnificent, more beautiful, or any of those things. He could not be made more. He simply was. And then, in a mystery that is truly beyond our comprehension, it seems that eternity could not contain the love of God. That's not true, by the way. But human language has to try to speak of the mystery, and it has to use terms that seem almost contradictory. But the reality is, in Scripture, seems to indicate that eternity couldn't contain the love of God, and so it spilled over in the act of creation. Or as the scriptural language says, God wanted to tabernacle, to be with man. And the truth is, we can increase his happiness one iota. He did it for us. No gain in him, just complete generosity. And that is what we must begin again to manifest to the world by being 
contrary to a culture that is contrary to Christ. And contrary to Christ means contrary to the Trinity, where it is not acknowledged and adored. And now, formally, the constitutions of many nations began with a preamble that began with professing belief in the Trinity. Now, even in Ireland, the last bastion, that preamble has been removed. That is not simply a symbolic removal of God from the human family. It is real removal. And it will only be through sacrifice and suffering and a willingness to die to defend these truths that God will again become known, loved, and served in this life so that all of us may be happy with him in the life of eternity for which he has created us to participate in that which we have no right to participate. And so let us always remember, science has not the right to put God under the microscope. Science has not the right to declare when God created. No thing that comes directly from God comes under the vein of science because science itself is a created entity that can tell us nothing of the origins of God because that is a matter of faith and supernatural grace. And so let us always remember the Trinity is in charge. He has come to give us a life. Let us live that life so that it is not the brave new world we cooperate with, but that ancient world, that world that began before time began. And let us not get bogged down by that which depresses us. How big is the universe? It really, in the end, won't matter. Because as St. Augustine points out, it's measured not by weight or quantity or size, but by time. When time is up, creation is up. And so let us each take advantage of the time that God has given us. For is it appointed once for man to live and then to die? Let us pray that all men are found worthy to enter into that life of the Trinity for all eternity in, in heaven. Oh,